So our instructors for today will be Sarah Hewen and Chief Len Garris with the City of Surrey in British Columbia. We'll also have Crystal Yates, who is a captain with and EMS Community Risk Reduction Specialist with the Philadelphia Fire Department in Pennsylvania. And then we also will have Robin Patton and Assistant Chief Kenny Dunn with the Henrico County fire, Division of Fire in Virginia. And we're also pleased that this event will be hosted by NAPSIG as well as ESRI, and we'll have Jennifer Schottke, who is a fire EMS specialist with ESRI, uh, co-facilitating this session with us today. So just brief overview for those who might be new to NAPSIG. Uh, we are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, and our vision is that a nation of emergency responders and leaders are equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcomes for survivors. And so this virtual training session is one of many that we host every single year to help build that capacity of emergency responders and GIS practitioners uh, in, in applying technology to enhance our mission. And with that, I will hand it over to Jennifer Schottke with Esri to provide us an introduction. Jennifer, over to you. Great, thank you, Rebecca, and hi, everyone. Uh, let me start just with a brief introduction. Esri is a global company providing GIS technology, which enables organizations to create responsible and sustainable solutions to problems at local and global scales. Um, at ESRI, we believe that geography is at the heart of a more resilient and sustainable future. So I'd like to start by re uh, reviewing these training purposes, uh, set the context for what you're gonna be hearing today. We would like everyone to leave today's presentation with a clearer understanding of what we mean by community risk reduction and understand how GIS helps support CRR programs. Number two, spatial thinking has always been an important asset in the fire service. Everything happens somewhere and undesirable trends and potential hazards are heavily influenced by location. Our first case study from Surrey, British Columbia will show us how the use of proven, tested, measured GIS analysis can increase the effectiveness of programs intended to disrupt these unwanted patterns. And then in our second case study from Philadelphia, we'll see how a basic spatial query to achieve the same, can achieve the same objective. Both types of analyses are sound and effective. Understanding differences in the complexities of analytic methods will help you determine what's most appropriate for your community. Our third purpose of our training is that, uh, you know, understanding that analysis is only of value when it answers the right questions. We'll talk about the importance of aligning your data analysis with your organization's strategic intent. intent. Now, fourth, one widely recognized characteristic of effective leadership is valuing different skill sets. This can be hard to do in the traditionally hierarchical world of the fire service, but that's changing and today we're gonna to see two shining examples of how great leadership and effective team collaboration have led to results beyond measure of the effort. And finally, our last purpose is to touch on some of the key principles in the new NFPA 950-951 standard and guide. This is a terrific resource that can help guide all fire departments as you seek to manage and use data effectively. Now in this next slide, you see some of these same topics, but framed as objectives. And basically, we hope that you're gonna come away from today's session with actionable ideas and strategies from the presentations that you can use to enhance your own CRR programs. Now the next slide is, goes over some, uh, some key terminology. I'm not gonna walk through these. Uh, the terminology is listed here as a training resource, and uh, we're, we'll, that slide will come up in just a minute, and you can quickly review some of the terminology that uh, we'll be using in today's session. Um, these definitions will be available to you, uh, and Rebecca, if you can move on to the next slide. There you go. These definitions will be re available to you uh, after, the, after the webinar for reference. So before I hand the, hand the floor over to our first presenter, in this next slide, I'd like to briefly comment on the graphic 
and acknowledge a few of the many con contributions others have made to the methods and principles that are going to be covered today. Working with fire departments in workshops across the country, my friends at Alchemy Management Solutions and I have become convinced that the integration and alignment of these three elements is central to developing a successful CRR program. A strong and cohesive sense of mission, effective leadership to guide the organization through the challenges of changing environments and tactics, a strategy to build organizational intelligence with robust data management and analysis and sharing practices. Informed by the profound changes and pursuant successes in the UK Fire Service around these ideas, my Alchemy Associates, uh, John Bonney and Charlie Hendry, have generously contributed to our collective confidence that these principles can and do work. Likewise, the best practices taught, nurtured, collected, and synthesized by Jim Crawford and the many others with Vision 2020 have informed and influenced what we will see today and so much of what we have all learned about community risk reduction. In fact, the story you're about to hear from Surrey Fire is the first North American research effort I came across through the work of Vision 2020. Much more recently, Jim introduced me to the researchers at Johns Hopkins University who have applied similar methods to their work with the Baltimore City Fire Department. In addition to the excellent research and resources Sarah and Chief Garris will be presenting today, I'll provide links to resources from all of these programs at the end of today's presentation. Now clearly, this is a really exciting time for the Global Fire Service. Many of you have been working on community risk reduction in your departments for a long time. I know that it gets really frustrating some days because people just don't seem to get it, but the tide really is shifting. Excellent thought leadership is emerging, and GIS as a technology has matured to the point that it's very approachable and effective for supporting this mission. Today, some very special people will be sharing their experience on this journey, and we sincerely hope that today's webcast will help you unfold yours. So thank you for joining us today, and with that, I'd like to introduce our first speakers. So I met Sarah at a NAPSIG user group meeting in New York City long before her association with the Surrey Fire Department. I instantly recognized in Sarah the heart, intellect, passion, and energy it takes to be a great fire GIS analyst. I was thrilled many years later when Surrey hired Sarah to do the work you will soon see. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with Chief Lynn Garris's work. His reputation precedes him in this field. Surrey is the first department I became aware of in North America that had actually measured, documented, and published the kind of statistics that we've seen as well from our friends in the UK. This is largely due to Chief Garris's leadership, and with that, I'll turn the floor over. Welcome, Chief and Sarah. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, we're really happy and actually honored to be uh, part of this webinar. So if we can flip to the next slide. Um, so a little bit about Surrey, um, we're uh, uh, 316 square kilometers if you're a Canadian and 122 square miles if you're an American. Our population uh, for 2015 is 514,000. Uh, 390, and our growth rate is about 1,000 citizens per month, uh, which has been consistent for about the last 10 years. We're the second largest city in British Columbia and the 12th largest city in Canada. So next slide, um, a little bit about us. Uh, we're, we have 15 fire stations. Uh, we have 356 uh, career uh, fire uh, suppression staff, 10 administrative uh, chiefs, two fire IT staff, one communications technician. Uh, we have 43 volunteer firefighters and 46 apparatus. The genesis of, on the next slide for this uh, initiative is, uh, is a uh, uh, commissioned uh, uh, publication, which is the right decision, evidence-based decision-making for fire service professionals. And the next rendition of that, and that was funded by the uh, Canadian Centre for Security Sciences. And uh, shortly after we published that, the uh, Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police Research Foundation asked us to 
produce uh, this version, uh, which is the right decision for uh, police services. And basically, this publication is about a, a, a methodology for solving problems, which is very similar to uh, what you're about to see in our initiative. And then the third uh, rendition of this, which is our trilogy, which has just been published in the last week, and it would be the next slide, which is evidence-based decision-making for government workers. And all of these publications, including companion workbooks, are located free on this website, uh, which is the University of the Fraser Valley's criminal justice research website. So, uh, and those are free and welcome to uh, download those if you find them useful. So uh, based on that uh, genesis of our, our way of thinking that we've uh, developed in the, the city of Surrey Fire Services, uh, I can maybe start to talk about the story that's associated to our home safe program, which would be on the next slide. Um, basically what we did is we, uh, we started with uh, the understanding that education programs targeting vulnerable areas within a community uh, or non-random criteria as which we uh, use this research in order to determine uh, individuals, and you'll see this uh, further on, are individuals in the populations that are most likely to have a fire or be injured by a fire. And based on our uh, research through the Canadian Centre for uh, Disease in Atlanta, uh, there's a number of studies that helped us focus on who those residents were. So we wanted to provide new tools to improve uh, these people that are uh, at risk, uh, to improve their safety and learn more about their hazards. In the next slide. Uh, so we started out with a 20 re uh, academic 20-year review of fires that occurred in British Columbia. It was completed in 2008. As no surprise, 75% of the fires that we attended were residential properties, and 30% of those fires, only 30% of those fires had a working smoke alarm. This study also included international best practices to demonst that demonstrated functioning smoke alarms save lives and that fire risk is non-random and they include high-risk people, properties and places and that fire prevention home visits and education combined make a difference. And that would be uh, next slide. So in 2012, uh, the University of the Fraser Valley, which I'm a uh, faculty there, uh, we analyzed uh, fires across Canada, and we came up with three main conclusions to help support our argument. Smoke alarms do save lives. Uh, smoke alarm functionality deteriorates over time, and at target fire prevention education efforts do increase smoke alarm coverage. And the next slide would uh, sh uh, give us an indication what we saw in 2008 is that the blue line suggesting that as time goes on, uh, uh, fire alarms or smoke alarms are present more often uh, due to the generation of housing stock, but the fact that smoke alarms actually functioning at the time of fire was decreasing. And the next slide. When we looked at uh, the province as a whole, between 2011 and 2014, there were 17,971 residential structure fires, 234 deaths. Deaths without a, smoke shining, uh, a functioning smoke alarm, uh, basically 84% of those deaths, uh, the smoke alarm didn't work. 15% were under the influence of uh, drugs or alcohol. 24% were asleep and 16% did not receive uh, a warning. So next slide would suggest that uh, elderly, 28% uh, of the deaths were 65 years or over compared to 15% of the population in British Columbia. That, that rate of uh, a representation of over 65 years is going to increase to about 20% in the next 10 years in British Columbia. We also know that the elevated risk of the very young, mentally or physically ill, economically disadvantaged and rural community residents. Our next slide uh, shows why in the course of British Columbia, why it's so important, the death rate for 1,000 fires in British Columbia without a working smoke alarm is 12.7, and the death rate with a working smoke alarm is 3.4. That's a difference of 177%. When we, when we wind this on the next slide into, uh, into the current day, we just finished a uh, three-year three -year evaluation uh, pre and post of our uh, smoke alarm movement. 
and what we were able to discover in the province of British Columbia, a population of about 4 million people, and you're going to switch to the next slide, right? And we can see on the left, and I'm sorry this is a little bit uh, busy, but uh, the success here that we're really proud about in the province of British Columbia is that the death rate dropped by 65% per 1,000 citizens. Death rates per 1,000 fires dropped 37%. Present and, and functioning smoke alarms per 1,000 fires increased by 26%. Fires without any smoke alarms decreased by 17%. The uh, absolute death rate on the top in the middle of the chart shows us at about 19 deaths, residential deaths. This is the lowest death rate that we've experienced in British Columbia in the last 30 years. So we're quite pleased about that. The inverted triangle basically shows you the death rate pre and post the uh, beginning of the movement. And you can see that at, it sums up at the very bottom by a, a rate of about, or, or an absolute number of 27 uh, individuals that basically uh, should have perished in fires as opposed to the pre and post analysis. So we're quite pleased about that. So our next slide, um, we'll basically uh, take a look at how, uh, what Surrey looks like. And what we did is we focused uh, geographically at the high proportion of uh, elderly citizens over 65, the high proportion of young children under six, unemployed, single parent families, and highly residential mobile. And if you just click it once more, there will be a banner that will show there. And basically what we did is we, uh, we focused once again on that non-random criteria of the population that were most likely to have to be injured or die in a fire. And uh, I'll turn this over to Sarah and she'll tell you how we did that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So we're also lucky today on our call we have some of our awesome GIS staff here at the City of Surrey. And before I started here, um, they have a great working relationship with Surrey Fire Services, and they actually came up with this methodology. So I want to make sure that uh, credit is passed on to this uh, fantastic group, and I re really enjoy working with them all. Um, so with those criteria that we just saw uh, combined with some hotspot mapping, and we'll get into the nitty gritty of how we did this analysis because uh, uh, it's, it's proven, it works for us, we've noticed some great results and I want to be able to make sure that you can take this away with you and rewatch this webcast and kind of follow along with the analysis uh, so you can also do this in your own community. Um, but at the end of this, uh, the firefighters delivered a prevention education uh, package to uh, these uh, vulnerable people and also go in and test their smoke alarms. They also do this when they're um, at incidents, if there's a, a call for a slight medical where they, uh, testing their smoke alarm is not going to cause too much of an issue, they'll also test those as well. So let's get into the nitty gritty of this analysis here for within the GIS. I can have the next slide please. So uh, to start off, you're going to have to uh, find and gather all of the information that you'll need to conduct the, uh, your analysis. Uh, for ourselves, we used uh, Statistics Canada data, both 2006 and 2011, uh, popu population-based information, household information and employment, uh, spatially enabled files for land use, zoning, address points, lot lines and roads. From a records management system, and I know some departments do not have one, but from your fire marshal's office or your fire commissioner's office, uh, the location of these fires within your community with either an address or an XY coordinate attached. Uh, if your data includes an XY, you can plot this uh, using ArcMap right into your window, and if it's only by address, you can create your address uh, locator and then geocode these into your map. As some of these points will be on top of one another or within a very close distance to one another, uh, here we ran the collect events function to create a count of fire incidents for each of these places. Uh, this results in points of different size as seen to the uh, right here on the map, and the larger the point, the more incidents. So if we can just click again, it'll just zoom into our north end of the city here where we tend to have quite a few fires. 
there. So we've got one area there is really prone to having fires. <laughs> uh, and if I could have the next slide, please. From there, once we have the collect events um, feature class, uh, perform the kernel density analysis to obtain the concentration of fire incidents. As you can see here, the areas shaded in red and orange are areas with a higher concentration of fire incidents. This is the same area that we just saw with the larger size point on the map. Um, and this is a raster-based file. As we'll be conducting further analysis with vector types of geometry, we're going to convert this kernel density raster into a polygon by running the raster to polygon tool. As for the analysis we'll be conducting for this project, we're only interested in the highly concentrated areas that are above the 10th percentile. Uh, select out only those and save this as a feature class, and we'll use this again later in the analysis. And then if I could just have it click again, and we'll just zoom into that area again. And then we can have the next slide, please. So this here is showing some of our census information, pretty bright and colorful, and I was trying to get it so that you could see there's a lot of these that are actually on top of one another. Um, with census information, it is, uh, can be trying sometimes trying to get it uh, cleaned up because they, they produce it in a format that can be used by multiple industries. Um, the census information might take some time to clean up and prep uh, to use within your analysis. We had to create age groups for the population under the age of six, so this is like, um, combining anything like ages uh, less than one, two, three, four, five, as well as populating the groups for 64 years of age and older, and some of these could even be in groups themselves within the data. As this information was in spreadsheet format, we had to locate the common identifier between the spreadsheet information and the dissemination area geometry. Statistics Canada provides dissemination area area IDs to their data so they can link the, the data tables to the geometry. So it's pretty easy for us to do that. Uh, for those of you unaware of what a dissemination area is, there's small areas within a population of four, 400 to 700 persons. For the unemployment information, we looked at the labor force participation data and uh, specifically the unemployment column. For lone parent families, we looked into the marital status household dwelling information. Uh, specifically at the lone parent families by sex of parent and the number of children. Finally, for people who lived at the residence for less than a year, these could be looked at as constant movers, and within the census information, we focused our attention to the mobility information and the movers data. Within the 2006 census, we were able to utilize the dwelling age, specifically looking at buildings pre-1991 as the data was uh, to the debt dissemination area level, so that group that's 400 to 700 persons. However, in the 2011 census in Canada, they, um, they changed it a bit. So in the National Household Survey, this data was aggregated to the census tract level, which is a population of 2,500 to 8,000 people. So to bring that information down to the dissemination area was really difficult to do. Um, however, some municipalities, uh, we do it in ours, we do track the construction uh, information to each property, so this could also be used as an alternative. Um, and if I could have the next slide, please. So once all the data is formatted in our spreadsheet, the Z score is created to, uh, for each of the dissemination area. And for those of you who haven't used that scores in a long time, here's the calculation for it. Only the top 10% of areas are used are those with a score greater than or equal to uh, 1.64. These spreadsheets are then imported into ArcGIS's tables, and each one joins to the dissemination area geometry and exported to its own feature class within the geo database. New fields are created to flag whether dissemination area is greater than or equal to 1.64, or if it's not. And for those that are greater or equal to 1.64, they're given the value of 1 and everything else a value of 0. And this is completed for each of the five feature classes. And then we'll amalgamate all of those. And those that come up with a total of 5 are those are, are areas that we're going to be focusing on to go pick. Those communities reach all five of that vulnerability risk, um, and these, these will be our main focus uh, for the population. And then if I could have the next slide, please. So 
next we're going to be focusing on our zoning information and select only those zoned as single family residential. As apartments and condominiums are mandated to conduct regular smoke alarm and fire alarm testing, they are not a focus of the home safe program as these people are, uh, in buildings are already visited regularly. We will then take our address points from our corporate GIS and then intersect these with the single family residential zoning polygons. These addresses are now uh, going to be part of our, our focus. And uh, as we've completed this program several times in the past, because we go out each year, we're going to be taking out the addresses that we've already been to. But for those of you who are just starting out, you don't need to complete this step. And if I could have the next slide, please. And you can just kind of keep clicking because there's going to be a bunch of different slides coming up here. So just to recap, we've taken our fire incidents, geocoded or plotted the XY coordinates on the map. We've created a density map detailing the high concentration area for the incidents, and we took the top 10% of these areas. We took the top 10% of our census information for populations less than the age of six, greater than 64, unemployed, lone parent families, and those who move frequently. And we have selected our zoning information, single family residential polygons, and selected the address points that fall within those boundaries, as well as removing out any that we've previously been to. And this is what we end up with, and this is a map that was actually created by our GIS section. So within the address points, you select out uh, those with the polygons created from our kernel density raster. These are properties that have experienced a high number of fire incidences versus areas, other areas. As you may have addresses, as you may have many addresses and limited funding, select out how many properties you would like to visit for the first round. You can break these out into phases and create cohorts, and we've done this. We're up to cohort 14 actually right now, um, and then you can track. Uh, when these were visited by the crews. Uh, as we currently don't have a mobile technology solution uh, in place here to collect the information in the field, we create individual 11 by 17 maps for crews to visit the properties, and they're provided a script to communicate with the homeowners and or tenants, as well as a package containing brochures on the home safe program, fire safety in the kitchen, fire safety for seniors, children in fire, home fire escape plans, smoke alarms, portable fire extinguishers, and cooking fires. Uh, Surrey has a high South Asian population, so we also include some of these brochures in Punjabi to ensure that the home safe message is being communicated to this population as well. So this map that you can see here is a sample map that we've used, that we used this year for a home safe program. When creating the map, ensure that there are some landmarks that can assist the crews. This can include parks, schools, places of worship, Ensure the streets are labeled and only the addresses that they're to visit show up. As illustrated on this map, we also have the building footprints as well. Uh, only include a certain number of residences that should be visible on the map, uh, most likely the, um, the ones that they complete in one visit. So here, this is a typical maybe afternoon for, um, say, a shift in Hall 9, that they can go visit all of these homes and then mark it down on, we can click on the next slide, please onto this spreadsheet, uh, whether they've made contact or if it was just a delivery only. Uh, we collect information on uh, whether the contact was made, and this means that they spoke with the homeowner and or tenant, or if, the delivery, if it was delivery only, the package of brochures was left at their door. Crews will attempt multiple times to make contact. Once the crews have completed the spreadsheet, it's sent back to fire prevention and support staff will enter the information into a spreadsheet that can then be imported into our records management system. This will enable us to track properties and the occurrence of fires afterwards. We use the ClickView application to track fires against the properties that we've been to. We noticed this year there was a resurgence of fires in one area and we actually created a second treatment program uh, specifically with uh, cooking fires because the majority of these fires were happening in the kitchen area, just to reiterate the message on fire safety in the home. And if I could have the next slide, please. So where to find all of this data? Uh, planning departments are a wealth of knowledge for census, land use, and zoning information. And what do you do when you don't have your own GIS staff? Um, a lot of uh, Government agencies now have GIS trained per, uh, personnel on staff. Uh, you know, speak to your planning department, engineering, public safety, 
or even your human resources department to see if you can get some uh, assistance with the analysis. The local college and university students could take this on as a project. Uh, they usually have uh, a term project and uh, would be a great learning experience for them as well. And if you don't have any of those available, there's always GIS consulting companies that can help you with the analysis as well. And also taking some uh, courses yourself. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Chief Garrett. So, uh, I think it's important to note that during this time period that firefighters uh, knocked on or uh, visited 40,000 uh, residences. And as a result, in uh, 2010, for example, 30% of the uh, fires in British Columbia and about 28% in the city of Surrey had a working smoke alarm. There's about 2,200 residential fires that occur in the province annually. So as you can see, by focusing both in Surrey and then um, uh, the province uh, in, in, in total, uh, we had an increase from 30% to 41% of the residential fires with a working smoke alarm. In the city of Surrey, that number is now sitting at 54%. And I can tell you that last week that I looked at it was about 61%. So, and I know that our colleagues in the United Kingdom, um, they are telling us that approximately 88% of the residential fires that they go to have a working smoke alarm. So we have a long ways to go, but we like the results. The next slide will show you what those results look like. Something that we didn't, intend, uh, didn't expect would occur, but as you can see that we've had a 48% decrease in the rate of residential uh, fires uh, per 1,000 in the city of Surrey. Also the while, we've had a 24% increase in our housing stock uh, over that period of time. And the next slide uh, will help us focus on what the uh, rate of death and injury per 10,000 residents were in the city of Surrey, and it's a 53% decrease also the while a 24.6% increase. So um, the thing that we didn't anticipate was the rate of residential fires that dropped, but I, I'm believing that those are the fires that people are alerted to that become very, very small, don't become reportable and manage them on their own as opposed to getting out of control where we have to attend. And the next slide uh, will basically point you towards uh, some stuff that we're really proud of, which was indicated that uh, we have uh, peer-reviewed and published in the Journal of uh, Safety Research the reduced frequency and severity of residential fires followed by delivery of fire prevention education on-duty firefighters, a, a cluster randomized controlled study uh, by Dr. Claire and myself, Dr. Plekis and Jennings. And the other uh, paper that we've produced is a temporal and geographic clustering of residential structure fires, a theoretical platform for targeted fire prevention and that one really indicates that, <clears throat> or starts to focus on, on the characteristics of the people because those seem to be the areas where crime occurs as well. So they seem to be the same people and we just actually have one in press right now that is gonna focus on uh, pre-hospital care or emergency medicine uh, in terms of a locational study as well and we're hoping that will be published soon. So the next slide, um, we'll talk about uh, an indicator, point you towards uh, two publications that are on the University of the Fraser Valley's website. Uh, one is Smoke Alarms Work But Not Forever. That was uh, uh, published, I think it was in 2012. And more recently, uh, which is a, uh, an evaluation of what happens from 2012 to 2015, which is Smoke Alarms uh, Work But Not Forever Revised. And you'll find both of those on the University of the Fraser Valley's website of the Center for uh, Criminal Justice Research. And Speaking about that, the next slide will uh, point you towards uh, something that we're particularly proud of. Canadian fire chiefs uh, during a process uh, a few years ago expressed its concern about its ability to access uh, peer-reviewed publications and the University of the Fraser Valley website, our University of the Fraser Valley rose to the occasion and has created this, sent this site. And you'll notice in the top that there's a public safety uh, search database and you can actually go in and query that by title, by subject, and it will lead you to the, uh, an international world uh, area of publications associated with the query that you've made, whether it be crime or fire, or medical or other items, and that's free. Uh, the only thing you will find if you don't have a membership of the actual journal that it's attached to, you may have to purchase it, but in most cases, you'll be able to read the abstract and it's available. 
So that was kind of bring us to the end of uh, our presentation. And uh, I, I once again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. And uh, we're excited about learning from uh, the rest of the presenters as well. Well, super. Thank you so much, Chief Garris and Sarah. You know, not only is the work that you're doing fantastic, but your willingness to share your time and talents so generously is making a difference in communities throughout the world. So thank you. And our next speaker is a very special person as well. I first met Crystal in May of this year during the workshop that we conducted with the Philadelphia Fire Department. This organization has been on the forefront of community risk reduction in this country for years, and having the honor of participating in a workshop with their leadership team helped me understand why. It's people like Crystal with her powerful intellect and infectious spirit for serving everyone around her with cheer, making a huge difference for the people of Philadelphia. They're very fortunate to have her in their midst. And Crystal, I want to welcome, welcome you and thank you for joining us today to share your perspective on CRR and GIS. Thank you, Jennifer. Good day to everyone that's joining us. I'm going to start right with the next slide. My name is Crystal Yates. I work for the Philadelphia Fire Department, as Jennifer said. We serve the residents and visitors of the fifth largest city in the U.S. My 18 years of experience with the fire department includes seven as a field paramedic. I worked at three different fire stations. I worked as a lieutenant in the capacity of field supervisor, continuous quality improvement officer, HIPAA, or the privacy office, and I served as the EMS complaint investigator. I was promoted to the rank of captain in 2013, and my current position is in the EMS community risk reduction or Mobile Integrated Healthcare Office. Fire Commissioner Sawyer is really passionate about community risk reduction, and as Jennifer said, we had a week-long training session with Alchemy and Esri groups. So when we talk about community risk reduction and fire suppression, most of you know, one might think of smoke alarms, community assessments for common types of fires to focus preventive efforts, and reduction of injury and death by fire programs. And EMS, Community Risk Reduction, is more no, well known as Mobile Integrated Healthcare. Now, Mobile Integrated Healthcare focuses on working with others in the healthcare community to improve safety, improve health, and reduce unnecessary utilization of healthcare resources. Many of you in the EMS industry know of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's Triple Aim. And the Triple Aim says we want to increase patient satisfaction and outcomes. We want to increase the health of the population, and we want to decrease per capita health care costs. So with all that said, I have plenty of experience in EMS with the Philadelphia Fire Department, but absolutely no GIS technical experience prior to the training received by Alchemy and Esri. I was invited to join this conversation to show that even a novice can use the tool to begin to analyze real data. Next slide, please. So as I stated, the Alchemy Group and ESRI conducted that week-long course in May of 2015 at our headquarters in Philadelphia. The training was focused mainly on community risk reduction and the strategic planning process for community risk reduction. We received one day of training in GIS. Needless to say, none of us reached the mastery level. So after my introduction to GIS, I was excited to go home to apply what I had learned. So this map you're looking at now is the map that I created at home the night after Robin and Jennifer taught us uh, GIS and the tool. I used a base map that included the fire stations in the Philadelphia area. The red dots re represent the fire stations. If you'll notice, you will see some dots, particularly up left-hand corner, which has a zero. All of our fire stations do not have a medic unit attached to it, so I filtered the medic units out. So the ones that have a number are medic unit stations. The ones that have a zero do not have a medic unit attached. Then what I did was I took a super user address query that I created from our patient database. For Philadelphia, a super user is a person or facility that calls 911 20 or more times in a six-month period 
We have a lot of super users in Philadelphia. Currently, our list is 280 long. I took that super user map table and I laid it on top of the map that I had with the fire station. All of the small black dots are our super users in the city. I then took the hospital layer and placed that on top of the other two layers to figure out who we could reach out to to try to partner with teaching people how to use 911 appropriately and to have a targeted marketing campaign. You'll see the one at the top, Roosevelt Boulevard, Medicare, the number, the address. I pulled that up, and that's not a HIPAA violation, but it is one of our top user facilities. I pulled it up just to show that when you click on the dot in this software, that's how much information will show from your table. So this particular super user called us from February back five, six months, 144 times. So next slide, please. And even with my limited experience, I've been able to use this tool with little difficulty. The next two slides I'm going to show you, this one and the next one, shows what can be done when you work with your GIS specialist as a team. So this slide that you're looking at now is not our super user or how I utilize a group. These are the people in 2014 that did not pay for their EMS response or transport to the hospital. What I did with this group was I took my same table and queried out the payer information, the insurance coverage of those people. So if you will see, the red dots are the people who have Medicaid insurance, the blue dots are the people who have Medicare insurance, and there are very few green dots, but those are the people that have private insurance coverage. I looked at that information and determined that most of the time we don't get paid for Medicaid patients. So I decided where could we send those Medicaid patients? We have free health clinics in the Philadelphia area, and I layered those health clinics on the map of the not medically necessary group to find out who we can partner with to push these patients to better health care resources. And in the next slide, So this slide shows two maps. These two maps were actually created by our GIS specialist. We do have one GIS specialist in the fire department, and we have access to others in the city of Philadelphia municipal government. But this one was created at the request of our EMS executives. Our executives were looking to make management decisions on medic units or ambulances. They wanted to know if we should better place them they wanted to know if we should upgrade some of our BLS units to ALS units, basic life support, to advanced life support, and whether we should relocate or even um, add or take some away. The map on the left, that's our kernel density map. And what it shows is the EMS responses for 2014. And it's the same as what uh, Sarah was showing you, that red area is where we get the most concentration of our EMS responses. That is Center City, Philadelphia. The next, the orange and the yellow layers show runs for the year, 1,400 runs up to 2,800 runs for the year. The red areas, we responded over 2,800 times. And then the purple and light green runs are 700 runs. The map on the right shows our response time by medic unit, and these are average response times over the year. Same thing, January 1st, 2014 to December 31st, 2014. And I'll quickly explain that the green, both light and dark green colors, fall within the NFPA 1710 standard. We meet those responses nine minutes or less. Our higher one or highest one is the pink up in the corner they actually took 10 minutes or more on average to respond. And it, their location is interesting because they're right along water and they're in a small area that doesn't have a high EMS request for responses. So they are frequently moving from their area to other areas, so they take longer to get there. So those are my three maps. And what I wanted to say, or what I want to leave with everybody in the audience is 
Prior to the GIS training, I was completely unaware of the amazing tool we had at our fingertips. As a team, the GIS specialists and your field level providers can use real data mapping to make informed decisions. The winning combination, however, includes knowing your system. I felt like I know my system, I know what I see, I know what I hear, and I can help the GIS person help me to ask the best questions. And then working together, the GIS expert can map the information and analyze the data. So thank you for your time, everyone. I appreciate participating in this conversation, and I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Jennifer. Thank you, Crystal. And I hope everyone's as encouraged as I am by what Crystal's shown us today. I love the way she didn't waste a moment to put on her thinking cap and apply what she learned about spatial thinking and analysis to a problem she really understands, she sees and deals with every day. When empowered with the tools and the information and support, she demonstrated how quickly that spatial thinking can make a difference in the way we think about significant issues in our communities. So thank you again. And now we'll transition to our final set of speakers, Robin Patton and Kenny Dunn. I've asked them to join us today to share what they have discovered about their data over the past few years and how that is contributing to the way they think about protecting people in Henrico County, Virginia. Robin is a hydrologic engineer by training and ran the State of Virginia's wastewater program for many years. Soon after retirement, she was looking for a way to give back, and she offered to spend some time helping Henrico with a little data issue they had. Assistant Chief Kenny Dunn is responsible for community risk reduction for Henrico and has advocated for and supported efforts towards many of the principles we've been discussing today. Robin and Kenny, thank you for joining us. Please tell us about what leadership change in data look like in Henrico County today. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thank, thank you and thank NAPSIC for having us on today to talk about this. And let me tell you, when we invited Robin to come in and help with a little issue, it, she showed us a whole lot of what we needed to know, and we'll get into some of that. Let me tell you a little bit about Henrico County. Henrico County is located in central Virginia and surrounds the city of Richmond on the north side of the James River. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Virginia, it's about 100 miles south of Washington, D.C. The county has experienced a consistently high growth rate for over 20 years, and our population is approaching about 350,000 residents. The Division of Fire provides fire and EMS response through 20 stations to 244 square miles with just over 500 in staffing. Now, a little bit of the history is the, uh, the current chief took his position in the fall of 2012. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, could we... Move forward with the uh, slide, please. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the chief took over in 2012, and we were less than six months from a filing deadline for reaccreditation. That process defines particular ways of looking at operations with risk and setting goals for improvement if you're not familiar with the accreditation process. And Robin was hired to help us with our data analysts, uh, analysis and, and GIS. When now we're a big organization, we have a type three IMT, we have all the normal specialty teams that a large organization would have. We're, we're ISO class one, and we've been accredited since 1998. So you'd think we didn't have much to learn. But Robin arrived, arrived and told us things we didn't really want to hear. We uh, didn't know what we didn't know, which is honesty to its very core. We're going to tell you a little bit about our department's journey on this path for continuous improvement. We are not where we want to be, but we know. But we now talk about data and analytics when we talk about budgets, capital improvements, operations, and community risk reduction. We're making every effort to include all levels of the organization in those conversations. And even though it's not what most of us envisioned when we first started out as firefighters. Robin? Next slide, please. Well, Kenny is right. Uh, many of you are probably looking at this slide thinking, ugh, my first slide screams nerd, but I promise it's not that kind of presentation. I'm just hoping that you'll come back and look at the slide later. Um, it has been a really rewarding relationship here with the fire department. I've learned a lot of things. I'm hoping they've learned a little bit too. 
um, I can tell you that um, if your job is being the hero, somebody like me coming at you with this kind of information that you see on this slide here um, and telling you that you just may not be doing that data thing right, well, it's difficult for anybody to receive that kind of a comment. But for, for a fire department, for a response department, I, I think it takes a special kind of leadership to integrate the kind of changes that we're going to talk about and to receive the information that I was bringing in. Um, I'll go through these very quickly. Most of us are familiar with data in the United States because of our requirement to report uh, incidents under the INFERS program, the National Fire Incident Response System. And there's a parallel one for medical information. That was designed to do a specific thing in the late 70s. It wasn't really designed to capture data and provide information in a way that's useful to the administrative management of a big department or any department on a daily basis. Um, if your experience with data is that one vehicle, then um, you probably made decisions about how data is integrated into your organization and the staff that are responsible for that based on your reporting requirements, not your integrated information technology or data and analytics uh, view. And so when we started this journey to kind of shake that up a little bit here, um, I began to look for some guidance with this particular industry that was new to me um, because I felt like GIS was a way that we could uh, serve up information to all of the troops here in the fire department and uh, because maps are the way they consume data. And so fortunately I had some assistance from 950 and 951. Both were in development when we started this journey and provided a lot of help to me and has become important to the department too. Next slide, please. So I think about data kind of like I think about my uh, organization of clothes. Um, what I really want is effective organization, easy access, and efficient decision support um, so that I can get sleep in for that extra five minutes in the morning, right? Next slide. What I actually have is something like this. Uh, imagine hitting that when you're in a rush and late for an appointment, important meeting. I, it's cold and I might want to wear my wool pants. I might be able to find them. I'd like a compatible top, maybe that yellow one that's going to brighten up the day for me, uh, but I can't find it. And often I end up with an outfit that's poorly matched, think data that doesn't particularly answer your questions, or whatever is at the top of the pile. Think about using that same old standardized report. So I realized that this kind of analogy isn't going to work well with a lot of uh, uh, men, and I'm working with a lot of men. So next slide. Uh, my friend said to me, maybe you should use the garage analogy. And that kind of took hold. Um, so are you a person with one big box of nuts, bolts, screws, and nails, or do you have a nice system of labeled drawers? Can you put your hands on the pegboard right on the spot where the perfect screwdriver lives, or do you dig, dig, dig? And when you need a cord, do you access it quickly, or are you dragging many miscellaneous articles tangled and knotted along with it? So again, this is kind of, kind of the data analogy here, um, and this is one that, that sort of works for the fire department as they move forward. So Chief Dunham, I'll hand it back to you. Next slide, please. What we see here is a picture of my garage. Uh, actually, it was a picture of our data garage when, when Robin got here. What we began to see is what most of the tools or data we needed, but we weren't able to get to what we needed efficiently at all. So we, we began to assess what we had and our ability to get at it. We realized we needed a vision of where we wanted to go and a plan to make sure we didn't throw out the baby in the process. Because obviously there's some things in there that we, we need to keep. That, and, but we, need to, uh, we also need to make it accessible. We also realized this was not a, a one and done problem, but our plan would require ongoing guidance to maintain a nice orderly garage of data. But how to do all that? We train in fire ground operations, active shooter incidents, EMS. How do we do that? The next slide. And so as Henrico came to the conclusion that they wanted a 
a technology strategic plan. They'll live alongside their standards of response cover and continuous improvement strategy. Um, I began to search. Google wasn't helping me too much, but um, Ms. Schottke and some of the tools inside Ezra actually did help quite a bit. And so next slide. Uh, what you see here is we found that the standard for data development, NFPA 950, was almost ready to go, and the um, 951 standard for build or guide for building and utilizing digital information was in draft. And the information in that document um, we took and moved into our, uh, used it to guide our own process for developing a technology strategic plan. And NAPSEC has this, uh, has the Henrico Guide available as a resource on their website. So we've provided the link here just in case you'd like to take a look at it. We've had this document in place for a little over a year now. Implementing some parts have been harder than others, obviously. We are not autonomous. We are part of a larger local government structure that has an overarching county IT support. Next slide, please. Before, our data and analytic function resided under a planning captain in the organization chart. Great intentions, but they were firefighters first, and often would get transferred out, we'd have to start from square one all over again. We decided we needed to train, train professional IT management at a high level within our organization to help us understand the larger IT picture and to communicate our needs accurately in a language IT professionals understand. Back to the county IT management. Basically, we're looking for a translator. We are currently in the hiring process for an IT management position that will become part of the fire department's executive management team, sort of a, a chief information officer for the fire department. Next slide, please. Another part of our plan is a series of committees and working groups to properly integrate data and analytics vertically throughout the organization. We've already begun to form work groups to help us better design our technology requests by giving the users a voice to help us understand what works and what doesn't, and also to carry the leadership's objectives back to the stations or firehouses. The new fire IT manager will lead our internal committee for prioritizing and integrating projects, the HFD Technology Steering Committee. Now, the, the Joint Technology Advisory Committee actually met without that title to get guidance and buy-in from the county's IT management as we developed our technology strategic plan and is currently working on developing an RFP for a new records management system that reaches across the network boundaries of just the fire department. Next slide, please. So when we did our rehearsal uh, for today, I mentioned to Robin that we didn't have any of our analysis or maps to show and tell. So I see she's added some of the other photos. We're in the process of building the foundation for a program that is already influencing the way we provide service to our community. And although our wins thus far are improving response, we know we are on the right path to implement programs to disrupt hazards before they occur. During reaccreditation, our operations committees, our GIS person, and our county IT people work together to develop a risk class for each address in the county based on data from the tax office and distance to a hydrant. We refer to them as hazard class. Now when a 911 call comes in, the complement of vehicles and personnel dispatched is right-sized, specific to the fire ground operations plan for that type of structure based on risk. We discovered Esri's pre-planning template for developing pre-plans, and our station GIS reps have converted fire department connections and knock boxes from our paper map books into spatial data that is now part of the county's integrated GIS and available on the apparatus mobile data computers. We are underway to convert the remaining notebook information to GIS data. And now this system of fire response data can be used to inform hazard classification, to print run books and station maps. And from there, perhaps fire inspections and even some of our law enforcement arm. Through ArcGIS Online, we've also selected an application for smoke detectors that can operate on mobile devices in addition to MDCs. We are changing our smoke detector program to provide this service to our at-risk locations based on demographics and history. We'll be looking at Surrey's work to tweak that criteria. Next, next slide. Next slide, please. 
So in the end, we're like everyone else. We're looking to identify that sweet spot where our actions identify the factors and communities that increase hazards so we can develop the right programs to control or eliminate those hazards factors before tragedies occur. Go ahead and click. GIS is the platform we're using to view that information and to manage our programs. And that's all we have. Thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you. I am particularly grateful to Robin and Kenny, all of our friends at Henrico for what they've done and what they've shared. They've made more progress in a shorter period of time than any I know, and I applaud not only your vision and expertise, but your willingness to share. The strategic plan is a gold mine of information and guidance that can be of value to everyone, and so a sincere thanks to both of you. And to all of our speakers today, Thank you so much. In this slide are links to the resources I said I'd share. And with that, Rebecca, I'll hand the presentation back over to you. I know we got a little bit of a late start, so I'll let you decide about how you want to handle questions from the panelists and from our audience. And thank you so much to everybody. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And, and thank you very much to all the instructors today. We very much appreciate the contributions that you've made to this effort and sharing your agency's best practices. Uh, we will be publishing a recording of today's session as well as this PowerPoint to the website within a couple of days. And we will send out the link to that as soon as it is posted to all registrants and participants. Uh, so just a note on that, I know we've received a few questions on that. Um, and with that, this concludes today's session on uh, best practices in GIS for fire department risk reduction. Uh, so for those who need to take off from their day, you're welcome to. We will answer a couple of questions that we receive through the Q&A feature in WebEx um, for those who would like to stay on and cover those uh, questions briefly. So the first question that we're going to ask the uh, panel of instructors today is, I believe this one pertains to uh, Surrey, British Columbia. The question is, do you get your census data from fire department surveys, city census, or state, province, country? How do you use the census data compared with incident data over a range of time? That's a great question. Uh, Statistics Canada is a federal agency, um, so they do a census every five years. We've actually got one being conducted next year, which is fantastic. We're getting the full form census back. Uh, so we get it from there. They could, uh, conduct it for right across the country, and then they'll uh, release the information to all the uh, levels of government. Uh, we use this for, for planning purposes, for parks and recreation, fire department, policing as well. So that's at the federal level. Uh, all of our incidents, we, uh, we have our own records management system, so we do uh, have the information available there, as well as we have access to the provincial information to you through our um, fire commissioner's office as well. So, Excellent. Uh, Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, <laughs> Do any of the other instructors want to comment on the uh, use of your and the access of your census data? This is Robin from Henrico, and I'll say a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, I have worked a lot with uh, RTS Online's uh, demographic data. Um, the fire department here in Henrico has um, their own RTS Online organizational account. And we're in the process of, of handing some of the tools to look at the sort of pre-configured demographic data that um, ESRI provides through that portal or that, uh, that web-based GIS. Um, but, you know, it's like anything. You need to kind of understand what's going on in the background. Um, but that, I think, is very user-friendly, very accessible, and very rich for, um, for anybody. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, one other question that we received, I think that may be um, on the first one, is have you looked into using a collector app to gather data when out visiting the different structures and, and homes? I think this pertains to the fire prevention and the smoke detectors. 
Uh, it's Sarah from Surrey. Uh, we're in the process right now of evaluating some tablets to be used out in the field for mobile inspections. And uh, once we se secure which ones we're going to be using, um, I'd love to have uh, the opportunity to work with the crews to actually collect this information out in the field with our, our home safe visits instead of uh, it's such a duplication of effort having to record on paper, have somebody enter it into a spreadsheet and then enter it into our system where we could just have a, an interface built from the, uh, the geodatabase straight into our records management system so it's only being touched once by, by a person, that's it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sarah. We have another question. I think that um, maybe I'll, I'll direct to uh, Henrico, if that's all right. <laughs> Actually, other Rebecca, okay. Rebecca, I'm sorry, yeah. uh, Jennifer, if, yeah. I, if I can jump in. Um, you, I, I would actually go ahead and do that question, and uh, while Henrico is answering that, they might want to comment on the collector um, app, because I think they have some experience with that as well. Sure. Great. Well, um, we can cover that first, if that's okay, Jennifer. Sure. Okay, so Rebecca, do you want us to talk about Collector? Sure, that's fine. Uh, okay, um, so I'll tell you quickly that um, this was one of the real hooks that, that got our field personnel involved um, in, in being their own sort of, uh, their owners of destiny of their data. Uh, we started experimenting with RGS Online and the Collector app uh, through special events because we run uh, two NAP NASCAR uh, events each year here in, in this area. And so uh, we built our sort of special event platform where we have people coming in from other jurisdictions and it's a lot of activity, a lot of potential for uh, a hazard that changes the view of everything in the moment. Um, and so that's where we begin to see the power of this mobile um, mobile access, web access to data, um, a real on-the-fly, develop-it kind of approach. Uh, we've got firefighters now who can use templates um, even to do things like uh, lead um, search and rescue or um, or do damage assessments. That's a part of the way our Type 3 team thinks about uh, those kinds of events now. And then I'll pass it back to Chief Dunn, who can tell you the recent experience about picking the smoke detector approach. Yeah, one of the biggest uh, hurdles we could always always had with smoke alarm uh, inspection or installation, if you will, was the fact that we could never track where these things were going. We were we were putting out five or six hundred smoke smoke alarms and we couldn't tell you where they were going because the paper or documentation was pretty terrible. Firefighters aren't real great uh, advocates of writing things down on paper, uh, especially when it comes to smoke detector uh, uh, installations. So having this app where they can uh, literally go on their, their personal phone if they like or in a mobile data computer environment and they can literally touch the picture where of the location that they're at and enter just a few uh, text fields from drop-down boxes and, and it's logged. We can tell where every smoke detector has been inspected, each one that we have installed, and what sort of battery life was installed now with the 10-year batteries in place. So it's been a huge time saver and it is one of the technology uh, platforms that the firefighters here are most excited about. Great, thank you very much. Um, we're going to cover just uh, one more, well, one more question here, um, and I think this is a, a, a general question for all of the uh, all of the instructors and panelists with us today. And I think it's just more one of those overarching questions from a, a fire department or leadership perspective. So the, the individual indicates that the major barrier that they've experienced is changing the mindset of their managers and leaders to adopting and supporting GIS initiatives and understanding what the return on investments and benefits are. And so their question is, how do you get that buy-in? Um, and, and in most cases, if not all, you know, the approach may be that there is support starting at the top, but maybe for some of the other ones, have you had any experience where you've, you know, you know, pushed it from, you know, your individual perspective, maybe at more of a ground level. Um, and how have you done that? And, and, and how have you kind of worked to get that buy-in that you need from your leadership? 
Well, I, I'll tell you from Henrika's standpoint, uh, Robin's creating a list of departments, and she's got her baseball bat that she used on, on our leadership <laughs> team. Uh, it really, to, to be honest with you, it takes a person who's not willing to take no for an answer, who's willing to um, to have the information and be able to present it in a way that the leadership understands that this is necessary. Um, and it's difficult for me because I, I'm pretty much an old guard. I'm a plus 30-year veteran of the fire service. So, you know, I've, I've been here from for a long time, so it was difficult for me to first understand. But when you see the passion and when you see, you find that individual that carries the flag, I, that makes the most difference. They, they are able to support their views with real data, and, and that's the beauty of ArcGIS is they, they're able to present the data in a way that, that even a fire chief can understand. And I'm sure a lot of you can appreciate that aspect of it. But I think, uh, it, and if you think that you're going to win the, the entire leadership of an organization overnight, it's just not happening that way. It really takes time. Um, you really need to start small, get your, your, your small wins and build to your large ones. Hi, it's uh, Sarah Zuri. I'm constantly building prototypes for things, uh, sometimes uh, being able to go through and show them something and then be able to, to see how it would act in action. I've been doing a couple uh, within ArcGIS Online right now as well as another tool that we could possibly use uh, just to get the thought process going and, and the rest of it, but uh, sometimes seen as believing and then and getting some uh, understanding there. It's, it's baby steps. That's the, the way I always look at it, each small step. If there's a little bit of acceptance, I count that as a win. And so this is Crystal from Philadelphia. I, I have a few things I want to add to that. Our leadership, our top leadership, is very interested in community risk reduction. I think the trouble was our um, upper-level management just didn't want to buy in, and you need that buy-in to get the field-level providers to follow. So our we paid for, I don't know how much it was, but we paid for Alchemy and Esri to come, and they put on a wonderful, wonderful week-long training session for us. And what that did for us is helped put a number of people in the room that don't normally work together, talk together, or do any um, data sharing. And it got us all to see that just at that small level with a room of 10 people, how valuable data sharing is, we started to move forward. The other thing that I would think is very important to note is that once you get people moving on it, you have to continue and you have to communicate. So once your team starts to know that you're very, very serious about this, you have to keep moving. And then you have to let them know that you're serious about it by doing. A lot of people in the fire service or a lot of programs, I think um, Chief Dunn mentioned that we get transferred from one position to another and then whatever program you were passionate about kind of falls through the wayside. So you have to really, really implement the program, have solid procedures, and continue, continue, continue. Main maintenance. Excellent. Thank you very much, Crystal. Appreciate all the inputs that all of the uh, instructors shared on that question. Um, if there's not anything else, I think that's all the questions that we're able to cover today. Um, again, I want to thank everyone, all of our panelists and instructors, as well as all the participants for coming out. Uh, and this will uh, conclude today's virtual training session. Jennifer, any last remarks from you? No, I just want to thank everybody again, and I want to wish everybody on the call great luck with the programs. It's a, uh, it's a, it can be a challenging uh, effort, but it is, it's well worth it. So thanks for joining us today, everybody. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.